Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 289 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's also where you can find out more about my book, Be Like the Best, and the Be Like the Best workbook. The book consists of 50 interviews with top fitness pros, and after each interview, is a be like, an action step, or a challenge that will help you be like the best. Go to continuefit.com for that. Also, where you can find past episodes, including the six-part series I did on racism in fitness. What can we do better? Been getting a lot of great feedback from that. So please go check those out and uh, share those episodes on social media. All right, today for the Coach's Corner, I spoke with Coach Boyle about the challenges of his current situation at MBSC. So they're doing outdoor as well as one-on-one training. Uh, We also spoke about a research study called Biomechanics of Breast Support for Active Women. For the results, Fitness University Business and Fitness segment, I'm on with Alan Cosgrove to talk about how being open does not mean business as usual. Lots of challenges for uh, certainly for the first few weeks. For the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, Adam Doughty talks to Tim Robinson about helping someone start a running program. Don't forget, Train Heroic is a human performance company that Coach Boyle and I both use to deliver all of our online training. We've been blown away about how well Train Heroic allows us to connect with our athletes. And if you're a coach not using Train Heroic yet, what are you waiting for? They just launched plans as low as $10 a month, and they have a free 14-day trial. And if you mention that I sent you, Coach Boyle and I will put a four-week athlete development program in your account absolutely free. If you're a coach looking for the best online training solution in the game, go to trainheroic.com and start your 14-day free trial. All right, for the functional movement system segment, Eric Degatti is on to discuss the FMS Hourglass and how to look at the entire system. For the Body by Boyle, online.com, hit the gym with the train coach segment. I have on Blake Gorley. Blake is the author of The Movement of Rowing. It's a new book, and he's done a great job with that. I know Blake from the strengthcoach.com forum, as well as his Instagram, and he talks a lot about rowing, obviously. And we're going to talk about the demands of the sport, the kinds of injuries that rowers get, the three injury mechanisms of rowing, foot and ankle anatomy talks a lot about the, the foot and ankle in this book, and it's really good stuff. I've been actually using the book for uh, to kind of work on my left ankle. Talk about rowing, prerequisites, screens, and his system for lasting change. All right, lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try it out. Still, we're only doing this, I promise, Coach Boyle and I are going to talk about this in a a couple minutes when we get off the phone. We'll probably go until July 1st. 30 days, just a buck. This is ending. Gyms are getting back, so people are busy. Uh, But you'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place... To have full access to Coach Boyle, he's on every single day. Check it out at shrankcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? You know, and I'm, I'm surviving. I don't know how's that. I usually say I'm doing great. I'm surviving the freaking new normal, the post-coronavirus world that we live in right now, mask world. Yes, yeah, so it sounds like the old normal here because we got you in the car, you're on the cell phone, back to, uh, you're, you're running around. Yeah, I actually... I run around. I had to go back to the gym today. We forgot something, so I had to drive back. And I thought, all right, rather than try to get you to wait a half hour, I'd just do it in the car. So, yeah, it is kind of the old normal from a acoustical standpoint. Yes. Coach, uh, what's going on? What are the challenges you're facing? You've moved to – you had the outdoor last time we talked to you, and then you were waiting to do indoor one-on-one as per Massachusetts regulations. So you started doing that. How are things going? 
I think going okay. We get we get people back every day, so it's going better. It's just, I mean, the the reality is we're restricted to about I would say we're somewhere around twenty five or thirty percent of our capacity. So that's difficult because now we, we've got people kind of sort of back to work. Oh, you know, the the PPP money is done. You know, we and the reality is there's not enough hours for everybody. We can't get as many personal training clients in as we'd like to. It's certainly not an ideal situation, but um, it's better than it was a week ago. And hopefully the Massachusetts numbers are trending extremely positively, even though some of the national numbers are not. And if that continues, then it's going to be hard for them to not let us open up right after 4th of July, because what's supposed to happen is that phase three will start on the 6th. And we'll be able to get everybody back indoors, obviously with the same restrictions, social distancing, all these things. So there really is, I hate the idea or the phrase new normal, but there is going to be, and I think I've said this every time we talk, there is a new normal. What, what we're going to be able to do is not what we were able to do before in a lot of ways. And that's just reality. Yeah. Um, in New York, we were gyms were slated for phase four, which is the last phase. And so they just announced yesterday that we can do, they're going to allow us to do anybody who was in phase three on by July 6th on July 6th, you could start doing up to 25 people outside, but uh, they might be moving gyms to similar to what you guys had phase four, 4.2 or something like of the phase within yeah. the phase. So we might not be opening and it's going to devastate. A lot of people are sitting here waiting around. Uh, you know, it's been obviously, we, you know, gyms aren't open in New York. So it's been, you know, three months, mid, mid March, you know, April, May, June, and it's going to end up being close to four months where officially no revenue. Although some people are uh, training on the DL a little bit one-on-one trying to be cool about it, but it's really sad, the randomness of it, of, you know, tattoo parlors, massage, massage can happen, nail salons, hair salons, uh, all play, all things that touch you. You're allowed to go inside a restaurant now, but uh, you cannot go in a gym. So uh, uh, pretty frustrating yeah, uh, it, on it, all counts. It's really frustrating because the lack of understanding in Massachusetts, we have a social worker who is in charge of health and human services. So she's not a medical doctor. She has no knowledge of fitness. She has, I think she has a master's or a PhD or something in social work. And she's creating all the regulations for everybody. She's determining Mary Lou Sutter is, is her name apparently. And she's the, you know, the grand wizard of coronavirus. So uh, we're, we're in an insane situation because they keep talking about, you know, droplets and, you know, people are worried about studies done in Korea in aerobics class. And they have no idea that it's sort of a Mike Boyle strength and conditioning type gym even exists in the world. They think every gym is, you know, Gold's Gym or Planet Fitness or one of these places where treadmills are packed in next to each other and people are huffing and puffing and breathing on each other. It's just, they, they, it's, I don't know. I, well, I don't want to say... There were, last Thursday, I felt like it was hopeless. I was really down. I was like, oh, you know, it was the first time I really thought, wow, should we just pack it in? Should we just close? Mm-hmm. And obviously, I'm not there now. I think you just sort of the, the week wears you down. But I can't imagine the people who aren't, because I've always said we're a big, healthy business. So I can't imagine the people who aren't. I can't imagine the people who really are struggling and who were day to day before this. Uh, I just think it's, uh, I mean, it must be, I, 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 sad is, a be, is probably the best word I can come up with, to be honest. Yeah, I feel really bad for the New York City gyms, because in New York, they go by region, not by the state. So New York City is still in, I think they're in phase, they just started phase two. So they were, they're a month away anyway from phase four, but then that phase four might get pushed back as well. So it's it's really uh you're right it, they just don't know what we're do what they're doing and they don't know what we do so it's pretty sad but um all right yeah, well and i said to you there's there's no money 
There's no money in health. There's no money in making people healthier. They can't tax it. And as a result, they don't care about it. They don't look at it. I, like I was talking to somebody yesterday and they said, you guys should, we should be an essential service. Fitness health should be essential. The idea that when you think, and I've said this over and over again, but the people that are surviving coronavirus are the healthy people. Yeah. And so why you don't want more healthy people, that's what's really going to keep your numbers down in terms of people that are being, you know, people on ventilators, people, you know, in intensive care, all those things, people going into the emergency room, healthy people, even if they do get the coronavirus are going to fare much better, but there's no interest in making people healthier. And there really seems to be an interest in not making people healthier. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I was talking to a woman who goes to a gym that I was renting from and I said, I checked in on her in mid April and I said, Hey, how are, you know, how's it going with you uh, on Facebook? And she said, nah, not good because I personally needed to go. I live alone. I needed to go to the gym. I lost like 40 pounds, but I, you know, still have a long way to go. And I needed to see those people. I needed the accountability to show up. And I don't have that now. And, it, you know, I don't like the Facebook Live workouts that they're doing and whatever. So I actually gave her, through Train Rock, I gave her a program that she could do uh, and, and made it easy for her to do with whatever she had. And I just checked in on her through Train Rock because they have that texting service through, through, through the app. And uh, she's back to, you know, killing it four, five, six days a week and, and things are much better. But... That's the problem is that they, for so many of people that go to the gym, I know a lot of people are still doing stuff at home, but for the people that really need the coach, they need that accountability, they fall into this, back into this vortex almost of, you know, they're not working out, so then they're eating crappy, and then they're sitting down, and they're not doing anything, and they fall into more depression, and it's really a vicious cycle, so it's, it. I agree, it's, and again, you know, if you give somebody a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but... Uh, you know, it's been proven how, how important this, this stuff is. Well, that's like you said, I mean, that's, and that's the actual mental health side, you know? So you start looking and thinking, I'm just talking purely the physical in terms yeah. of respiration and blood pressure and all those things. And then you add in the mental part for a lot of people. Like I said, it's just, it's really frustrating to, to see the complete lack of understanding in our elected officials of, of our, you know, our industry and what we do and how it's supposed to work. I mean, it's just brutal. Yeah. Well, for the next shutdown, they won't have any excuses. I'm predicting October because uh, right before the election. So, uh, you know, uh, that's my prediction. Well, I'll tell you something. I've, I've already said this and, and who knows? I don't know. Will I be standing by it at that time? But I do not believe that I will voluntarily shut my business down again. Because if, if you look at what happened to us, right, basically, we were asked to voluntarily shut down our business and it was to, yeah, you know, we had to flatten the curve. And, and I thought, I mean, I read all the information and I looked at it and said, you know something, these guys are right. We need to, you know, we need to do our part and we need to close and it's going to help to flatten the curve. And then it was, we need to control the surge, right? So we did that too. We, you know, we went another couple of weeks and we, you know, we controlled the surge, you know, we, we, we made sure, you know, that we helped our first responders and all these things that they were telling us that we needed to do. But then all of a sudden, you know, whatever, two months comes and now, you know, we want to eradicate the virus and get a vaccine. And you're like, wait a second. You know, this was just all about controlling the surge and this was all about flattening the curve. This wasn't about waiting for a vaccine or eradicating the virus or whatever it was. And what you realize is that, you know, you're dealing with people who are professional goalpost movers. That's what they do. They just keep, they change the rules as they go along and we act like stupid sheep and listen to them. And then suddenly, you know, you get all these people, you know, restaurant owners, gym owners that, that are broke and out of business. And so, like I said, for us, um, you know, I think it, it will be really difficult. I think if they say there's going to be another shutdown, I don't see the cooperation level. I think there'll be much more, um, civil disobedience there'll be a lot more problems when it comes around the second time because people will know that they got conned once and they got lied to so 
I don't think people will be as inclined to to go along. Yeah, and I, I do think there's going to be some serious collateral damage with this over the next six months. I predict January 1st, we're going to see a lot of businesses decide not to start up in the new year because basically they're behind the eight ball right now. Once they open and get to quote unquote full capacity, by that time, by that time it happens, they're going to be behind. They're still going to have to make up for clients that aren't coming in and they're going to, they're still going to owe some back rent. It's just, it's, it's going to be too tough. And I think a lot of people are going to give up and decide, you know what? It's time to get out of this business. So, or even well, that's, not that's starting. You start talking about, yeah, you know, collateral damage, you start looking at it and thinking, because eventually the collateral damage starts to hit the landlords because, you know, you're talking about somebody saying, hey, you know, something, you know, I'm not, I didn't sign personally on the lease. I'm just going to close up shop and walk away. And that's that. Yeah. Cool. So let's go on to uh, some training stuff. Uh, you posted a, on the forum, must read for all coaches, biomechanics of breast support for active women. Now this could be a little bit of a, T- topic sometimes that we, we try to we tend to shy away from just because we don't want to say the wrong things or you know it is a, a kind of a a, a little bit of a, a you know touchy situation breast support right but you wrote if you're a male coach you'll have a bunch of wow I didn't realize that or I didn't know that moments what were some of those moments for you that when you were reading this article that you were like wow well they, and I forget the actual stats because I put them in there but it was something like you know, 65% of women, you know, have breast pain at some point from exercise. 85% of women are wearing a sports bra that doesn't fit. Like the, the statistics really, when you read the article, were staggering to look and think, this is something that never gets talked about. You know what? The first thing that came to my mind was there are some hockey programs that I know, women's hockey programs, who don't have a female coach on staff. They have all-male staff. And I sit there and think, God, how can you have an all-male staff you know, woman's sport, because when you get into like, how do I, I mean, these are, you know, same thing we talked about. We talked about menstrual cycle and injury rates and those type of things. How do you have these conversations with female athletes that are really necessary, but that are really incredibly awkward, like sports bras, or do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. I I don't, you can't even begin to think about how to have that conversation with a young female athlete. That's not my, you know, I, I'm probably not a super comfortable conversation with my own daughter, but definitely not a conversation I'm comfortable with, with some, you know, young girl who's on my team, if I'm a coach. So yeah. I just think it's one of, it's another one of those areas. And I, and in some ways I love it. And Pat Van Galen, you're getting a shout out right now. I know you're listening to this, but Pat was one who sent it. And Pat's awesome that way, you know, in terms of just say things are what they are, but just, you know, looking and realizing there are still so many things that we don't know that we don't understand and something as simple as the appropriate supportive equipment for a female athlete or the fact like I said this to you, you know, when we were talking before, never thinking about, you know, as we're sort of, let's just say hockey players where we're kind of forcing all our female hockey players to run and never asking myself, gee, how uncomfortable might this be for some of these girls? I've never really had that thought. I did when I was reading the article and I thought, wow. And you know, I, same thing. How do you have the conversation? Mike, what about, and some people are going to say, you just have it. You just say, you know, yeah. but, and it, it's really easy. You know, I've gotten that from a lot of female coaches. You just got to do it. You just got to have it. And it's like, you know, it's kind of goes into what's well, easy for you to say. Yeah. But I can tell you that again, as a 60 year old man, father, husband, I don't see it as an easy conversation. Yeah. What about some of the women that you've, that are no longer like, for example, some of the uh, Olympians, for example, that you can kind of almost like reach out to just to say, what are some of your thoughts on this? What are some things we could do better? What are some women's issues that you also feel like besides the, the way, the way to speak to them specifically, but just some things that, like you said, like this is something I first realized about, but I didn't make the connection here was when I was working with Nike that we had a, a weekend conference and one of the things that all the ladies went to was this specific bra fitting, a sports bra fitting, uh, uh, like kind of lecture 
it was amazing that they were saying like how complicated it was and how important it was, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think you can still call on some of those women to say, what are some of those things that we, what do we miss? Yeah, well, no, you're right. Cause I've had, the, it's really good. Cause the, my older Olympic girls are great because I can have kind of some of these, I guess what I'd classify as more adult conversation with them and ask them things because we did, we had the whole menstrual cycle, you know, talk one time, you know, about like, you know, what do you really think about this? You know, is it practical? And they were just like, no, it's not practical. Like it, it doesn't, it wouldn't work. Yeah. You couldn't do it. You know what I mean? And it kind of made me feel better. The fact that they were just like, no, you, you know, you can't, you know, you can't stop the world, the athletic world because of somebody's menstrual cycle. It just doesn't, it, it's, just not possible and you know but i've never you know like this the sports bar thing i think in some ways is even more awkward maybe because you know there is i hate to say it but let's be realistic there is some sort of some male fascination with breasts if you think about you know gentlemen's clubs and things like that so it even is a a more awkward conversation than some of the other ones because like you can't go up to a, a woman and say you know Hey, let's put it, I'm trying to phrase this as politely as I can, but you can't go up to a woman and say, Hey, you've got unusually large breasts. How do you feel about running? You yeah. know what I mean? Like that, like, even though you'd like to be able to do exactly that, I don't think I can. I just don't, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't yeah. know how I have that conversation in any way that doesn't, you know, come out like, Oh my God, you know, coach spoils a creep. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that just, you know, it's like, so you just, so then instead, what do you do? You just kind of, you know, you dance around it and you just act like it's not happening, which is clearly not the answer. So I guess the, the, the good point is throwing that article up there and I'll bet like someone like Elspeth, I will bet my bottom dollar will write in because she's always really good in terms of women's issues. She's probably, I always think like from a, you know, a contributor standpoint, she's our top female contributor and she's never somebody who's afraid to have an opinion. And she's never someone to tell you if she doesn't agree with what you're saying, but we don't probably have enough of those people that are represented just even in the field in terms of just calling a spade a spade. And that's where I said, Pat's also great because Pat's, you know, more like me in terms of older, been there, done that, you know, not worried about what anybody thinks. And you really need those people to come out and say, as I, like someone like that, like just to send that she sent that article to me and I think me, Kevin, Brendan, a bunch of people. And, um, and, you know, was able to, to like right now, spark this conversation. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. And hopefully, like you said, we'll get more. We should post it. I'll post it on the, uh, in the article section as a recommended read as well. We'll post it out on, on uh, on their social media, so I think more we'll get more people to just at least visit and read it and put in the free section. So uh, obviously, yeah, have to do I it. think you definitely should because it really was one of those that, and I almost didn't even read it. That's what was interesting. Pat sent it to me, and I was kind of like, "Do I really? Am I going to read an article on sports bra fitting?" And then I thought, I probably should. And now, as I said, I'm really glad that I did because I do think it will. It'll spark up some pretty good dialogue absolutely good stuff all right coach we'll let you go we'll talk to you next week so enjoy uh enjoy the training that you're doing right now and getting ready for uh that's right for, you yeah, know we've got to tell you so far we need one more week if we get one more week of good outdoor weather then that's a huge positive and then if we get in it's all ifs if we get in on the sixth then we've we've really got a chance if we get inside on the sixth to kind of rescue our business to, to get in a situation where we can start to do some meaningful numbers that will help us to get out of the hole while the athletes are still around too. Exactly. All right. Thanks. Ian. Hey guys, right now at perform better. I want to talk to you about what's going on. Obviously the summits were canceled this summer, but 
Chris Poirier came up with a great idea, and that is the Perform Better Free Summer Seminar Series. And again, free, so everybody can do it. Just because we're social distancing doesn't mean we can stop learning. So it is uh, 67 of the top fitness professionals in the industry. I am one of them, I'm excited. I go August 24th, but they're live presentations and Q&A sessions via Zoom and uh, you can take advantage of them without ever leaving your home. They actually have some CEUs as well. It's gonna be 0.2 per seminar attended, so very cool. At the end, they're actually doing a, uh, a virtual social with uh, Kevin Hurchin, and that's gonna be in September, but this thing is going all the way until September 18th, so check out the free Perform Better Summer Seminar Series. All right, now it's time for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. I'm here with Alan Cosgrove. Alan, thanks for doing this. All right, thanks for having me. Almost, All right. almost there, right? I know, I know. You know, I just want to remind everybody, we normally, we, we're we talking a lot more these days because normally we record um, once, like four episodes and that lasts two months and then Rachel goes and then we'll record four episodes. So I don't really talk to Alan as much. That's why we usually end up talking on the phone for about two hours, but um, you know, they're back and you know, obviously we all know who does most of the work around results fitness, Rachel. So she's probably cleaning up right now while Alan's sitting back with his feet up on the chair talking to me. <laughs> so you're back. It was so exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. It's, it's funny that, uh, First of all, thank you for that, and it is congratulations. But uh, and I, I don't know everybody listening who's allowed to to be back and who's not. But really, what I wanted to talk about today is that uh, with the state allowed us to open, and then we had to wait another week for the county's guidelines, and then eventually we're allowed to open. But I think the perception, and I was probably guilty of it myself, is that we were closed for 14 weeks, and I think everybody understands. The only thing more rock bottom than 14 weeks of closure would have been a 15th week of closure, right? Mm -hmm. So actually the day you're allowed to open is the day you're at rock bottom, right? So it's, you're not out of the woods yet. Like, and I don't want this call to be negative because everybody wants to reopen, but it is not business as usual uh, when you when you reopen, which is, it, I'm, I'm hopeful that eventually it will be. I suspect that... Uh, most states seem to just once you reopen, there doesn't seem to be any further um, information. So you may have to create your own uh, reopening phases, let's say, within your, your gym. If, does that make sense? Right? Yeah. It's not just the doors aren't going to be open like they used to be um, based on what I'm seeing. Uh, I, I'm going to speak mainly about California because I, I know it, it uh, really well. But we've got a lot of coaching members all over the country, all over the world. And there's a lot of similarities with the the opening restrictions. Yeah, I, I was telling a lot of people, especially like in, in New York anyway, was j phase four, we have four phases, but phase four didn't mean, woohoo, everybody, you know, you could do whatever you want. It was really whatever phase you started in was your phase one, because yep. there are exactly. still uh, restrictions on capacity. There's still things that you have to do with, let's say, masks and cleaning and things that you're required to do. So uh, what are some of the challenges you're facing right now? So the, the biggest challenge is, well, first of all, I'm just going to talk from a, a business point of view that we now need more cleaning. It needs to be, uh, we've always been really clean, and I'm sure that anybody who's listening and tuning in the podcast regularly, you guys are running high level operations. It won't be enough. The cleaning that you're doing will not be enough. You're going to have to have more, more gloves, more personal protective devices. All our staff have to wear masks. Um, because of the, the, the rules in the gym in California is you have to wear a mask as you're walking to into the gym and through the gym, but while exercising, you don't have to. So, Perhaps a bigger deal for, for a commercial gym that you'll have to put your mask on and off as you're working through a bigger place. Ours, it's really just in until they get to their, their station. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the, the cost of cleaning. We have a professional cleaning crew coming in more regularly. And after every session, we're using this. We're wiping everything down and using this hydrostatic cleaner to clean everything. So we have to stop the sessions on time. And we have to have this gap between sessions and 
we're strongly recommended that we're appointment only. So that's kind of what we're doing. But the costs of the cleaning supplies have to come from somewhere. This wasn't a resource that you previously allocated because the costs of that are going up. So unless you're cutting from somewhere, right, unless you're cutting your budget from another place, the hard cost of doing business just went up. So that money comes out of the profits. So congratulations, you're already going to make less profit if the business ran exactly as it did before. <laughs> Our next restriction is, like I said, I don't know if we'll get any more information from the state or the county, but it's strongly recommended no sharing of equipment if we can. So the workouts did change a little bit, and so we do have a limitation of how many people. We're, we're running two groups at a time. Uh, with four in it right now, we can probably get a few more <laughs> as our operations continue. But it's basically two uh, workouts right now that we looked at what can we do before we would run out of equipment. Right? I'll be honest, there was the science to it. It's like, how many trap bars do you have? Well, that's how many people can do the trap bar deadlift workout, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's there's some limitations on really how many people you can have in at any one time. We're, it's social distancing, trying not to share equipment. Um, and I think if you, I, I think if you can do that in your own phase one, I think that's smart. I think eventually we can share some equipment, and I think eventually we'll we'll move to a, a more uh, relaxed environment. But for now, our guys come in. We have to ask them questions and do a temperature check. Then they move to their, their zones of training. So within our, our uh, gym, we just set up it's a little white markings on the floor for training zones. So in one room, it's squat racks, and we've got four squat racks in there, and each area has a mat, and we move in with any other equipment we need, like a kettlebell or a dumbbell or a bench. The other room has the TRXs, and uh, the trap bar deadlift area set up with a step-up box and a kettlebell. So that's really how we set it up. So they don't need to leave their area uh, while they're in the gym. They kind of train on the spot. Um, the, there are challenges there. Um, some uh, the other challenge is uh, not every client wants to come back right now. The government have done a great job of, I'm, I mean, I'm going to say make people afraid. Uh, that sounds negative, make people cautious, aware, whatever phrase you, you want to use, depending on what you think of, of uh, this. But there's some people who are just not ready to come back right now. So we're still running our remote classes for now. I suspect we'll have to change that in the future, that there may be an additional fee for that, or you won't be able to... to it, we can't... The cost of having additional classes going on file my staff for training in the gym uh, with a reduced membership and increased cost. Like the, the classes cost me, I have two staff members in them, so it costs payroll, uh, et cetera. So they're, they're, there's, these aren't free to put on, is what, basically what I'm saying, you know? So there are additional costs there, and no, not everybody, it, we lost some members during it, and not everybody, some people are on freeze, not everybody's come back, but we're so excited to get people back, and it's trickling up. But it, the, the positive side is all the things that were really a pain before, everything that you found challenging, you've got a chance to fix, right? Anything that you've got a complete, you know, blank slate to restart. And we're taking advantage of, of some of that stuff. Um, uh, things that we were slow to do is um, using an app. Um, we're using uh, an app now for all our, our programs. We're planning to do that. We just managed to roll it out during this. So everybody has that. We've bought iPads so that we've got, we, they don't need the coach to show you the exercise anymore because you have a video of the exercise right there. And we have iPads for everybody who's, who's working out. And we've moved to online scheduling because we used to just do that in person. They would make an appointment at the front desk and then, you know, it frees up my front desk to, to do some other stuff. So it's, there's, um, you know, I hate the thing is like, you know, uncertain times, all times are uncertain, right? <laughs> we never know yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. It's just different right now. But uh, it's the, what I wanted to get across to all our listeners is as much as you're excited to, to reopen that the phrase I've been using with, with my team and my athletes is it's like an athlete making weight for a, for a boxing match or a mixed martial arts match or a weightlifting contest. You've made the weight. All that does is allow you to compete. 
and that's where you're at when you're allowed to reopen, you can still lose, right? You got to be on your, your game. And, and what we're doing is, and it can be, I can see it being tiresome at the end of each session, my coaches have to disinfect all the equipment and put it all away. And 50 minutes later, start with a new group and bring all the equipment back out. And their instincts are, why don't we just leave it out? I'm like, well, it's why do you make your bed, right? Like, this is what you do. Like, we, every client deserves a freshly unwrapped, clean gym right now. And, you know, it, perhaps a lot of it is perception, but that's, that's the reality of where we are right now is that we've got to, you know, there's, there's some differences in how we're going to be doing business uh, for the next little while. Yeah. Wow. Um, for sure. I think, uh, you know, we're seeing that from some of the p- people that have opened as well. It's, there was a lot, a lot of kind of unexpected and, and expected things that were going to make life a little bit harder, but next episode, I definitely want to go a little deeper on a couple things. So, uh, Alan, thanks so much for doing this. All right, cool. Yeah. So everybody who's not open yet, just get t- a ma- pick a date that you think you're going to reopen. And with the restrictions I'm talking about, like it's probably going to be appointment only, restricted numbers, uh, restricted access to equipment. And uh, like plan on that so that you're ready to go when you do get the go ahead. Don't be waiting to get the go ahead and then have nothing in place. Right. So start just pick a date that you're like, we're going to open July the 15th and hopefully you're open before then. And if you're open later than then, you're still ready. But, But be ready to run your new model as soon as you get the the heads up. Great stuff. Alan, thanks again. Hey, this is Adam. This is Tim. Welcome to the Train Hook Data-Driven Coaching segment. Oh, yeah. So uh, Tim and I thought, you know, given that it's getting nice outside and I see lots of people running through the neighborhood, that we uh, we talk a bit about running. So with people in the gym and uh, trying to get some exercise in, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there who are, who are picking it up, and uh, we thought we'd offer some experience and tips on how to do that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, kind of the story that led up to this was I am not a runner, I say by nature, but I'm just not. I'm not someone that really enjoys it. When I was competing, I was only running because coach made me. So for me, it was kind of like this mental shift between where I, where I was in the weight room, lifting heavy loads, um, being able to keep track of my progress to to now having to adapt my training, right? And the first thing that, that kind of came to mind when all this came to fruition was, you know, I'm going to get sandbags and, and a duffel bag and load those things up and do some resistance training. Um, but honestly, it, it became kind of monot- monotonous, right? And I kind of became snow blind to my own training. And knowing that I take pride in, you know, still being relatively athletic into my 30s, I, I reached out to Adam for some help. And he was able to designed some training for me that was based around, you know, athletic movements. And a big component of that obviously was running. Um, and that kind of scared me at first because I didn't know where that was going to go or how I was going to feel about that or how I was going to make my body feel. And for me, it was much more of a mindset change, but it's been great. It really has. I, I've, I've actually taken to running a little bit, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a little more to it than that too, which was you, you have your kind of like lifting sessions, which are geared towards the things you like. You had yeah. some other goals about about just like feeling better and maybe mm-hmm. losing a little bit of weight, right? Um, you know, and trying to undo hours of sitting. You know, so it's like, well, it'd be it. nice to get outside. Um, and you'd expressed a little bit of interest in running, so we we kind yeah. of got an easy way to get you started. And that was um, it. That's what's that's what's been holding me back too. Is like, where do I start? And that's where you really pushed me in the right direction. Right. Yeah. So, you know, for from my perspective, if you're not doing any running and you want to start. Uh, anywhere is a good place to start. So Mm -hmm. Tim already had a pretty good level of fitness. So he was pretty confident he could go out and run for half an hour comfortably. Sure. Um, And so for him, you know, just like anything else, there's a load management, you know, aspect to this, which is saying like, well, he hasn't run at all. He's a bigger guy, you know, Tim's six foot plus and uh, 200 pounds plus. Uh, (laughs) So he's not going to win any marathons anytime soon. And we have to be a little bit aware of maybe some, maybe some more injury risk there if he picks up a lot of miles. Sure. But certainly he can, he, you know, he can run 20 or 30 minutes a few times a week uh, mm-hmm. at a relatively slow pace for the most part, especially yeah. to start out with. And he's going to improve from there because he's starting from, you know, uh, a novice level of fitness there in terms of running. Bingo. And so the first thing there is to like to set your expectations for him. You know, Tim, you know, like you said, it's pretty simple. Like my goal is to run for 30 minutes. 
right. and to enjoy it while I'm doing it, you know? So that's a pretty simple goal. And yeah. we'll bump up some of that, that time or, or mileage there uh, gradually and, and eventually give you a little bit of speed work and something like that. That's kind of fun, but sure. it doesn't have to be complicated a, to start out with. Yeah. And as a coach, that's part of what we do anyway, right? Managing expectations. And I think that's tough when you're transitioning from pulling heavy load to like something like running. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, you know, even if you can't run or your clients can't run, very long for very, you know, or very far at a time, you can start out with something like running 20 or 30 seconds and walking a minute or two, kind of the oh, interval yeah. almost. Sure. And it doesn't take long uh, for the fitness to accrue there and then to be able to kind of start inverting those, you know, kind of rest to work ratios. There's a couple other things, which, you know, I talked about with you, especially given that you're not a super experienced runner. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of those was to be aware of overstriding. Mm, yeah. And, you know, this is regardless of what school thought, you know, if you like pose running, whatever it is, um, one of the biggest features of novice runners is that as they speed up, they tend to take much longer strides than they need to, uh, yeah. instead of moving their feet faster. Um, cool. and it feels like, cause it feels natural. Yeah, I'm going fast. Yeah. But what that can do is it can get your, your leg out in front of you so that now you've introduced these braking forces mm. and, you know, which is not good for your injury risk or your e- efficiency. So, right. It pays, you know, pays to maybe move your feet a little bit faster, start a little slower, make sure you get that, that turnover, keep it kind of high. Yeah, absolutely. I was definitely overstriving at, at the beginning, overstriding, right? I was searching for this. I want to go as fast as I can. That's how I am in the weight room. But again, it goes all back to managing those expectations and where I need to be and where I need to go opposed to what I want to do. Sure. And the last thing there, which, you know, this is actually a little easier to do on a treadmill, but if you can, you know, cue your athletes into to hearing a heavy footfall, right? If, they, if they're running and they're, they feel like they feel or hear like they're really plodding there, a lot of times just cueing them to try to soften that can clean that up a little bit. Um, and they'll change maybe a little bit about their, their landing mechanics or uh, decrease their vertical, you know, oscillation there, their, their up and down movement, which is yeah. also better for efficiency. So a lot of benefits. Uh, starting out doesn't have to be that complicated. Start low miles a few times a week and, you know, increase gradually. Uh, smart, like, you know, how to do as a coach. So anything else, Tim? I think that's it. Get out there and run, people. Enjoy the fresh air. Stay away from other folks. Live the dream, baby. Uh, you don't have to run, but if you want to, go ahead. <laughs> That's going to do it for us today. If you go to trainroad.com, start your 14-day free trial. We actually got a few programs in there to help you get started really easy today. And we have new pricing starting as low as $9.99. Welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. My name is Eric Degatti, and today we're going to talk about the FMS Hourglass and how we uh, look at our entire system. In the 20 years since the functional movement screen has been brought to the public, there's been a lot of different letters that have been added on to just the FMS, where we have SFMA and FCS and YBT and motor control screen. And people often ask, how does that all fit in and where do I do each one of them? Well, the first thing we have to look at is the entry point. Is this person in pain or are they not in pain? If they are in pain, well, that immediately sends them down the hourglass into the SFMA. And once we get to the SFMA, we're not going to score it as a zero, one, two, or three. We're going to look at things as being painful or non-painful, functional or, or dysfunctional, and any combination of those. And when we break that out, we're going to look at patterns first. And then from there, we're going to look at specific interventions that we're going to do. And is it going to be a, uh, a motor control issue? Is it going to be a soft tissue dysfunction or is it going to be a joint mobility dysfunction? Now, if we look at the FMS for someone who's quote unquote healthy, that's someone who's not walking in in pain. And we're going to, again, start with patterns. We're going to look at those patterns and we're going to qualify them as zero, one, two, or three with that zero being pain. If we do find pain in the FMS, then we're going to just send them right down to the SFMA. So a lot of these tests have natural safety nets built within them. Now, the FMS also could be used as part of a return to activity or return to play, where once someone has gotten pain-free in the SFMA, we will send them up through the FMS. Now, once we get through the FMS, there are some additional tests that have been added as ancillary tests, including the uh, motor control screen, the MCS, and the YVT, the Y balance test. Now, the MCS is just a shortened version of the Y balance test. We found so much robust data in looking at upper and lower body single limb quarter uh, control in in the Y balance test that we wanted to be able to incorporate that um, with individuals uh, right on top of the movement screen. So that's where the motor control screen looks at just one of those planes, but is basically a shortened, condensed version of the Y balance test. 
And what the beauty of the motor control screen is, is that it's a little bit more um, uh, precise in, in what I mean by that is that you'll see changes in the motor control screen prior to seeing changes in number scores in the FMS. So if I'm working, let's say, on the active straight leg raise, I may see an improvement in the lower body motor control screen score before I see the leg raise jump from a two to a three. And so it's a good way to check our work and see if the body is receptive to what we're doing with it. Now, with the FMS, what we're looking at is we have to remember that we're only looking at movement competency and that we're not necessarily predicting success as much as we're trying to predict failure. What we're looking at with the FMS is, is do you at least have acceptable movement? Now, if we want to write a program for someone's goals, whether it be uh, performance or fitness related, we still don't have all the information we need in terms of where uh, they fall in terms of the continuum and all the other performance qualities such as uh, postural control and uh, impact control and, and uh, force production. So that's where the FCS or the fundamental capa uh, capacity screen comes in. Because let's say I have two athletes and they both play the same position. And one person does a great broad jump, but has a terrible carry in the FCS. And then the next person can carry all day long, but has a terrible broad jump. They both have the same exact movement score screens, but have very different profiles that the FCS shows us. And so now this is going to help us tailor their performance program a little bit more specifically. Now, the one mistake that gets made is we put things in in compartments and think we can only work one of these at a time where we could be working across multiple levels. So let's say I do find pain on someone coming in in the movement screen. I get them into the SFMA and maybe a clinician is working on specific um, issue that we found with pain in the ankle, but it doesn't mean I can't do conditioning for their upper body. So I may be using all uh, steps of the ladder of this hourglass simultaneously. Now, uh, the other mistake that gets made is that we use the wrong test for the wrong thing, where someone may like the clinical aspects or the specificity of some of the SFMA testing, and they'll try to use that for performance. The mistake that gets made there is a lot of times you may find things uh, wrong with someone that aren't necessarily an issue that's holding back their performance. Because the reality is, is you could pass the FMS and the FCS with flying colors and still fail some of the breakouts of the SFMA. But is that a is that an issue that's going to actually hold you back in your training? So what we have to look at is what is specific to this individual? Are they in pain or are they not in pain? Do they have a performance goal and where are their weakest links and how can I discover that through the system? And then also understand that there's an actual dynamic readiness component to this, meaning that what you tested two weeks ago may have changed since you saw that person last. They may have taken a cross-country flight or had a stressful couple weeks at work or have had poor sleep or diet. And now all of a sudden that movement profile has changed since you saw it last. So we do want to continually recheck these different things. Uh, along the continuum to make sure that what we're writing our program is based on what's actually standing in front of us and not what we saw two months ago. Being able to understand this hourglass from top to bottom and from bottom to top is what keeps us in check and to make sure that our programs are continually moving forward and keeping our, our clients and athletes at minimal risk. So that's it for today. My name is Eric Tagati, and this has been the Functional Movement System segment. For more information, please check out functionalmovement.com. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle Online.com. Hit the gym with the Strength Coach segment. Become an insider to Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning with staff meetings in services and complete access to the MBSC programs. Check it out at Body by Boyle Online.com. All right, today, my guest actually was an intern at MBSC at one point back in the day. Uh, it's Blake Gorley, and he has over 12 years of competitive rowing experience. Former Division I recruit. Uh, but he suffered a back injury, which prematurely sidelined his career. He's done internships at Stanford as well as MBSC. He was a performance director for a high school rowing program, a strength coach for a division one program. And now he's a performance coach for rowers at all levels. He has a new book out, The Movement of Rowing, Self-Screening Strategies and Solutions for the Ankle. Uh, he has great Instagram channel. He's always talking about some of these things. So Blake, thanks for doing this. 
Thanks for having me on, Anthony. I'm I'm really excited to be here. Never never expected to be on, but really honored and excited to share what what I can. All right. Well, I love you know uh, one of those things we were talking about you and I earlier is just kind of you know I, I know you from the strengthcoach.com forum and then I was following you on Instagram and be, being somebody who competes in an indoor rowing uh, competition every year for for fun. I started to kind of pay attention a little bit more and you were always talking about the ankles. And then I saw that you had a book out. So I was like, I gotta get Blake on here to really talk. Cause I think, you know, although this is going to be about rowing, we're seeing more people really truly understand how important the foot and ankle are. And you talk about in the beginning of the book about loading and exploding and how important it is. Uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about that when we get to foot and ankle anatomy, but how important, you know, it is from a power perspective. So I uh, definitely want to just get you on and talk about that. So I think I want people to understand that, you know, we're going to be talking about rowing, but think about this from the perspective of really a lot of different power sports. Would you agree, Blake? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times people step back and they say like we're one human right which is 100 percent true and most of this can just be applied to basic human anatomy and what i did was i just i just took it and made it specific to rowers and coaches um for for buy-in and and for a specialty for the sport but also so that they could they could really understand absolutely well Again, we're going to talk a lot about the foot and ankle, but I want to talk about the demands of the sport because I was telling you, for somebody like me who's never really been on the water uh, in, in in the boat, uh, I you know I'll mistake things for just being on the erg. So let's talk about the demands of the sport uh, from from the perspective of uh, looking at a movement perspective. Yeah, so it's it's a bilateral sport. Um, or that's, that's at least how people look at it when, when they talk about, well, there's no bilateral sport or there's, there's only, there's one sport that has only sagittal plane motion. And obviously it's not that simple. Um, so there, there is rotation, there is frontal plane motion. Um, I would actually consider it a unilateral sport just because of, just because of the differences in forces applied between the legs, even though you're pressing with two legs, it's still um, unilateral. It's, it's much more on the inside leg and we sit all day and we know how bad this is for, for our, our bodies. And we basically, as strength coaches spend our life trying to get people out of that, that poor posture. And then you look at the sport of rowing and they're literally sitting all day in class or sitting all day at work. And then they spend all day in their sport sitting. Um, so it actually ends up just exaggerating everything about, um, a desk jockey posture, right? Um, so super, super important to have mobile ankles, um, mobile hips, mobile T-spine, and a really stable core, really not that different from what we want for all of our athletes. But we do have to, to take into account that it's, it's a lot of load on the spine specifically. So the spine tends to be the, the most commonly injured site. So the stat is there's between 32 and 52% of injuries that occur annually um, in the sport. And then 82% of rowers will experience back pain annually. Oh. So it's, it, it's really a huge problem. And I, I believe some of it is uh, we can narrow it down to three, three mechanisms of in injury. And that's what I, that's what I believe. And people have argued with me a little bit, but basically there's, three ways that you can get injured in the sport of rowing. So it's not like football. It's not like you're going to get tackled from the side. You're going to tear, tear some ligaments in your knees. We, it's a non-contact sport. But when you compare it to contact sports, it's, it has the most injuries out of all contact sport, uh, out of all non-contact sports. And then it even has higher injuries than some uh, contact sports. So when you look at those numbers and when you're around it enough, uh, you realize something's off, right? Like it's, yeah. It, it shouldn't be this way and there's something we can do about it so like number one i think is training air so completely within our abilities as a coach or as a rower to understand when too much is too when too much is too much and when we need to spend more time on recovery right so 
Um, if we make a if we make an error in training, obviously we're going to put ourselves in a position where we might end up getting hurt. But totally under our control. Number two, um, I talk about technique, right? So it's a, a very technical sport. It's basically the same thing over and over again. And if you do it poorly, you're gonna you're gonna shift loads to places that you don't want it. Um, so specifically, the low back is pretty common. Um, rib stress fractures aren't as common, but they're very debilitating. And then, of course, there's there's shoulders and knee injuries, but really the back is the is the major culprit. And then the last one is movement uh, movement limitations, strength deficits, or some sort of um, energy system or conditioning deficit that will result in them breaking down while they're fatigued. So we have control over how we train. We have control over technique. Like it's okay to make mistakes because that's how you learn. But if you know that you're doing it wrong, you shouldn't be doing another load. Right. And then the third one, which, which is completely in our control as strength coaches is, is the movement, the strength and the conditioning part. And I think the biggest message that, that I want to get across is that we have control, we can do better. These injury rates are way too high. And if we look at it from those three perspectives, we can totally have an impact on the health and the performance of rowers. Uh, Blake, is this frustrating only because like, number one, I, when you say training error, I, I feel like this is a sport that I'm not sure if they're going to really be I don't want to say listening to the strength coach, but there's a way like, pu like putting a lot of miles in. I mean, that's just the way of the sport, putting a ton of miles in and you really can't control that as a strength coach though. Is that one of the frustrating parts of being, cause you've been on both sides. So strength coach and a coach uh, of the yeah. team. So talk to me about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, there's there's something about the sport that's that's very old school and it's like well my coach did it this way and uh the olympic athletes did it this way and they won gold so they they must be the definition of how you how you train and that's this probably gonna be a little tangent but <laughs> that bugs me too where it's like there's all of these within the rowing community there's all these sites that always post like oh this is this famous rowers workout of the day go and try it. And it's like, you didn't take into account anything about me. You didn't take into account my age, my experience, my, <laughs> my movement ability. Um, and that's, that's kind of just part of the culture. Yeah. You, you got to do more and that's how you get faster. And if you kind of push back, you, you kind of get the response of, well, that's, that's lazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, on, on the coaching side, I, I even reached points where I like felt pressured, like I had to do more, even though I knew it was wrong. Yeah. Um, and I was in a good position where I was the coach and I was the strength coach. So I could do it exactly the way I thought it should be done. But you're right. Most, most strength coaches are in a situation where they know what's right and they want to do what's right for these, for these rowers. But you don't want to piss off the coaches because then they just, they stop bringing the kids in and then you have no, no impact at all. Yeah. Yeah. Can we go back really quick? Just cause you said something that I don't really, I can't really picture. You said, you know, the force is applied mostly on the inside leg. What did, can you just explain what, what the inside leg is? Yeah. So when I'm sweep rowing, if I'm a starboard rower, which means my oar is on the left side of the boat, I actually kind of rotate over the boat and that sh I shift my load to my left leg. So that would be my inside leg. And then when I go to drive, most of the force is off my left leg. And then my right leg's helping as well, but it's a lot more loaded on the inside leg or that, that left leg. So it's more, it's kind of a circular, almost like a circular motion that you're kind of coming through. Yeah, exactly. So imagine, imagine the motion on the erg, but imagine having an oar that you kind of rotate to one side. Okay. And for that the catch can you just the catch is when i'm i'm completely like dorsiflex and all flex right at the bottom position and then right am i right about that yep okay yes cool um and then we obviously explode from there 
Um, okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure that I'm 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 on the right. What what was you said? Forces applied. Is there any research on that in terms of what the percentages of the forces are? Um, I don't believe I've found anything with yeah. percentages. Um, one interesting thing that I found is that they they took a snapshot of like the average weight of each stroke. And of course it's, it's a broad range because it depends on the size of the boat. It depends on the people on the boat, male, female, et cetera. Um, but the, the weight of each show ranges from, uh, 56 pounds to 166 pounds per stroke. Yeah. Um, and again, that's going to change throughout the race, but, uh, imagine having to do an average race is 2000 meters. So it's about 200 strokes. Imagine having to do 200 strokes or 200 deadlifts at 166 pounds just in a row without stopping. Um, you can imagine like if, if you're getting tired, you might start to break down and that might start to cause problems. Yeah. I've been there in that 2k race on the, on the erg though, but it's, it's brutal. I don't even know why we always say like, why are we doing this? <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> exactly. I know everybody hates that 2k <laughs> test too. Um, <laughs> let's talk about um is uh, by the way is the erg you know i know it's it's almost the best we have from the perspective of i know there's a, there's probably some machines that definitely uh, mimic the the uh the rowing the the actual rowing on the water but you, know, you can't always get that when you have 45 people on your on your rowing team or or strength coaches have don't have access to that so they're expensive how much uh, is the erg replicating what we're doing? It's it's honestly really close. And okay. they have come out with new models. And there's, besides the Concept 2, there's also competitors like like Row Perfect. Um, and Concept 2 even has a new model that's dynamic. You may have seen it. They, they're starting to have it in some gyms. And the only difference really is that the load's a little bit heavier. And in studies, they find out that you tend to break down quicker on the erg as opposed to on the water so there's some difference in load going on and if you're if you're on a dynamic erg some of the newer ones you move more like you're in the boat so it it, it takes a lot of pressure off of um, the spine specifically okay interesting so uh, again i i follow your your instagram channel and at one point i was like geez this guy has like an ankle fetish over here um, <laughs> cause uh, you talk a lot about the ankle. Let's talk about some foot and ankle anatomy because it's going to lead us into, uh, really that's the main piece we talked about. You know, the, the name of the book is, you know, self-screening strategies and solutions for the ankle. Obviously it's important. Let's talk about some anatomy. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I laughed at how much I was putting out on the ankle as well, because I started putting these things together because a lot of it's been in my head. Some of it I had to, to do a lot more research on, but a lot of it's been in my head and I just wanted to put it down on paper so I could send links to my clients and it, it ended up just turning into this book. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what, what I did was I, I dug deeper into anatomy because apparently I didn't have a good understanding and I'm sure I'll look back at this time and realize I didn't have a good understanding either, but um, three things stood out to me about anatomy. So like the structure of the foot and ankle, the loading of the foot and ankle, um, and the sensory input of the foot and ankle. And I think this obviously can be applied across the board to humans. And I just made it specific to rowing, but I didn't realize how amazing the structure of the foot and ankle was. And this is not helping with my argument about not having a fetish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the the foot the bones in the foot and ankle make up about 25 percent of the body so we know that there's something special going on there and then i specifically looked at um the ankle joint and how it locks into place and i'm sure everyone listening to this has heard toes up toes up toes up they've they've coached that they've been coached that way coming from being a rower i was never coached that and i had never heard that until i was um in these internships where I was working with other sports. So in the sport of rowing, like you don't even think about it, but we know it's good. We know it's a stable base. We know it's, it's more elastic to split, explode off the ground when we're, we're sprinting, running, et cetera, if our toe is pulled up. But what I didn't realize was that it was a mortise and tenon joint, um, which, which means 
Uh, it's basically the strongest woodworking joint in uh, known to mankind. So our ankle joint, when it works properly, is super, super strong and stable. So the, the talus rolls back and it locks into place in this kind of little house that's built by the tibia and the fibula. And it literally locks bone on bone. There's no daylight between the bones. So it's just rock solid. And it gives you this really stable base to either explode off the floor or explode off the foot plate in the sport of rowing. So that was, that was really amazing to me. And what I realized was that I was using the app, the um, complete anatomy app. I'm not sure if you've, you've looked at that yet, yeah. but it's, it's really cool to be able to, to make it visual because again, I've heard these things, but I'd never seen it. So you can actually put it into motion and you can like change the degrees of motion. So if you go all the way dorsiflexed, there's no daylight between the bones. If you come out five degrees, you start to see daylight between the bones. So what that means is you start to lose this stable structure and the advantage of what our ankles built to do, right? Yeah. So structure stood out to me. So if we have adequate range of motion, we have a strong, stable base, we can explode. Um, it's going to help with potential. It's going to help with injury reduction. And then for loading, um, again, I had, I had heard about fascia, but I hadn't really dug into it much. Um, and again, I have way more to learn on it because fascia is just something that you can dive into and <laughs> get yeah. lost and confused. Yeah. But um, there's, there's a common argument in the sport of rowing that, you know, some people say to rise up onto your toes. So you kind of roll over the ball of your foot as you come into your catch, that's where you, that's the front of the stroke or the front of the rowing machine. And some people say, don't rise up onto your toes. Um, so I was kind of looking into that because it's, it's just this common argument that's not really supported by anything except just technical opinions. So I was looking into how, how we connect our big toe to the rest of our body. And I came up on the superficial back line. And what that says is that there's, there's fascia connecting at our, the bottom of our big toe. It wraps the length of our foot back behind the back of our leg, all the way up our back. And then it actually ends up wrapping around and connecting to our forehead. So the superficial back line connects our toe to our forehead, which is insane. And to me, I explain it, I try to explain it as simply as possible. If I were to attach a rubber band from my toe, wrap it around my back and connect it to my forehead, if I come into the front of my stroke and I rise up onto the ball of my foot, just rising up onto that ball of the foot is going to put more stretch in that rubber band. So now I can launch that rubber band across the room as opposed to kind of just dropping it and letting it flop to the floor. Okay. So the, the loading mechanism stood out to me that way. And then the sensor input also stood out to me. So I read Dr. Emily's book, uh, Barefoot Strong. And she was, she was talking about the, the sensory input and um, how our foot receives feedback. And I'm sure, again, everyone's heard sensory input equals motor output. And that was really interesting to me because I was able to tie it into uh, coachable athletes versus non-coachable athletes. And I don't think any athlete is, isn't coachable. Uh, I think everyone is. I just think that there's um, something holding them back. I think everyone comes into their sport wanting to improve, wanting to change. And there's just a reason that they're not able to. And I think sometimes it's sensory input. So the, the quality of sensory input that we get is going to determine the quality of our, of our motor output or our movement. So what we, what we touch, what we feel, what we hear is going to determine how we move. And some of the ways that we feel is through touch and vibration through the base of the foot. And then in our, in our skin and in our muscles and in our joints, um, we have mechanoreceptors that also sense our environment, proprioceptors, et cetera. So the more, the more stimulation that we get, the better the feedback, the more motion that we have at the ankle, the more feedback we're going to get. So I realized that the, the kids that have limitations at the ankle, at the hip, whatever it is, those are the kids that I spend <laughs> the whole day coaching and saying the same thing and switching up cues and they just won't change and you, you end up getting frustrated as a coach. And then the analogy that I came up with 
was, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take a closer look at this athlete. I've been coaching them from afar. Now let me zoom up, get nice and close to them. And as I roll up to them, I realize that they're wearing headphones. So this whole hour of coaching, they haven't heard one cue coming from me because their ankle doesn't move. So they've been wearing headphones while they've been exercising. Yeah, for me, the big thing is we, we have to be aware that the way someone moves or the way someone doesn't move is going to really affect um, their output. And it's a lot more valuable than we think. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of golf a little bit too, is just, you know, when they started to realize physical limitations will create swing faults or can be a reason for swing faults. And then hopefully you fix some of these physical limitations. Then you have to worry about patterning <laughs> anyway, you need to worry about technique and that's a whole other ball of wax, but uh, it's very similar to that. But let's talk about what are some ankle prerequisites? Like what, how much dorsiflexion do I need to, in order to, uh, to, you know, have really be able to be a powerful rower? Yeah. So that was also something that I had to do research on and, and kind of establish because there's, there's thoughts and ideas, but no one's out there saying what the prerequisite is. And rowing's an interesting sport because you're, you're rowing on an angled foot plate. So on the erg, it's, it's the same thing as the boat, except in the boat, we can, we can adjust the angle. Okay. So on the erg, it, the foot plate's set to 42 degrees. So your foot's always at this angle. In the boat, it can be anywhere from 37 to 47 degrees. And that just depends on what your coach decides to do. And to be honest, myself included, <laughs> most coaches just leave it how, how it came. Yeah. Um, so they don't even look at it. They don't adjust it. So it, if you're rowing at an angle, you have to have a, enough dorsiflexion to get uh, your shins parallel to like straight up and down or sorry, perpendicular to the floor. So your shin should be straight up and down when you're at the front of your stroke. So what I did was I, I just started looking at what, what do we need in terms of ankle range of motion to safely get to that position on a somewhere between a 37 and 47 degree foot plate. And it turns out we need somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees of ankle range of motion. And if you refer to the SFMA, um, they say a healthy individual needs 40 to 50 degrees. So it's actually a little less than the extreme that, uh, the SMA would recommend, but if you have between 40 and 45 degrees, you can safely get into a good position. You can also apply enough pressure to, to not have it affect your performance. How go back a really quick, just to, um, the, this, our argument of how much the heel should come off. I've heard people say, yeah, don't take the heel off of the plate. What, and you said in the book, I think one to three inches is okay. Hard to tell too, when you're going that fast, anybody even can <laughs> see that you can't see it in a boat anyway, but, uh, number one, can you, can the individual switch the plate in the boat? And number two is, um, heel lift. Yeah. yeah the heel lift. Sorry. <laughs> and and uh, number two, oh, okay. the heel lift. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you understand how to adjust the foot plate in the boat, you can definitely do it on your own. And that's kind of a, a big thing that I'm recommending to, to coaches because a lot of coaches are one coach to 30. And if you were to try to adjust the boats to fit every single athlete, you'd, you'd be spending the whole day doing it. So I, I made an easy video that you can use your phone to measure set. You can do it in, in probably 30 seconds to a minute and, and just set it based on um, your ankle range of motion. Okay. And then, so you can make that specific to you. And the interesting thing in the sport of rowing is that the higher the angle that I can row at without technical compensation, the more out power output that I have. So, so it is beneficial to have more, more, more mobile ankles because you can row at a higher angle, which again allows higher output. And then, yeah, the heel lift, again, there wasn't a standard for it. Um, the only thing that the sport of rowing does is they, they make you wear heel ties. So they tie your heels down in the boat when you row at a U.S. rowing organized event or, or some international organized event. 
And what heel ties do is they keep your heels from rising above three inches. And the reason they do that is for safety measures. So if, if my heel rises any further than three inches and my boat ends up turning over and I'm under the water, my feet will get stuck and I can't pull out. Oh, geez. So for safety measures, they have you do heel ties no, no longer than three inches and they check it before you go on the water. So you can't get away with not doing it. So that's kind of where that standard came from was, was kind of that safety regulation, but also realizing that we want somewhere in between not being flat with the heel, but also not being excessively high because we do want that little bit of a load in the big toe, but we don't want it so little that we're not getting the benefit of rolling up onto that big toe, that extra stretch in the rubber band. The other concept there is that they found that if you leave your heel down, you are able to apply more force with your posterior chain, which is beneficial, but you also, it also changes the direction of force. So in the sport of rowing to be most effective, I want to apply force on a horizontal plane. I want it to be as horizontal as possible. I don't want it to get vertical or kind of lift up or down. And that's where energy leaks start to come in. So lifting up onto the toe slightly, somewhere in that one to three inch range, actually makes you more effective. Yeah. I actually, you know, on my own, when I was just observing my rowing partner on the erg, I started to say, well, listen, you need to come up a little bit because we wanted to, my, my thoughts were, I want the longest pull as possible. So I actually felt like we needed, if we, if we allowed ourselves to come up a little bit, we're getting a little bit more forward with the arms and we're able to get a longer pull. That, that was my, my, uh, um, my theory on that. Again, it wasn't based on anything other than me watching and figuring some things out. But for me, I was like, well, we got to have a little bit. I understood the idea about force through the heels, obviously, but I felt like too, I, I would see him losing this, the length of the pull. Yeah. And that's, that's totally correct too. So thanks for calling that out. Yeah. It allows you to get a little longer, you get a longer stroke. So you go further every single stroke. Interesting. Good. See how smart I am. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's talk about some screens that you're using to make sure to check on uh, what everybody's uh, what, where, where they're at. I started out using the FMS and I still use the FMS. It's still my go-to, but I just kind of, I use it kind of like the SFMA where it just, it guides you. Right. So you do, you step back, you do the whole screen, you figure out what stands out as the biggest limiting factor, and then you dig deeper. Right. And, and the, the guys with FMS and SFMA would say the same thing. Like you don't just stop there. You want to figure out why that screen's a problem. So what I did was I, I just, tried to break it down and I tried to make it so that groups, teams, uh, coaches and rowers would be comfortable doing this. And along the way, I also found out that there was also some extra benefits to some of these. So I have a simple pass fail screen. Um, and this is something that everyone's seen. It's just, it's where you, you do a half kneel facing the wall. You do a fist length away from the wall between your foot and the, and the wall. And then you just drive the knee to the wall without lifting your heel. And you're just seeing, can I touch my knee to the wall without compensating? Barefoot? Right. So that's barefoot or in a shoe. Um, that you're using, right? That you're using. Yeah. So that was, that's not super clear to me because in the boat, you're going to be wearing a shoe. On the air, you're going to be wearing a shoe. So do we really need to do it without shoes? Probably not. Um, but I, I don't think it will change it enough to to be a big problem. But what I found was that if you do that simple, that simple pass fail screen, if you touch the wall, you're somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees, which is what we need to be a successful rower. So if all you want to do is just have all your athletes do this really quickly as a team, just find a spot on the wall, see if they pass fail, you know, if you have to spend more time or if you know, if you have to look deeper, um, but that's all it really does. It just tells you if it's pass or fail. And then my favorite screen is the ankle number screen. And I have to give some credit to Greg Rose. And I don't even think he knows who I am, but I've, <laughs> I've seen him talk several times. And 
at one of the perform better summits, he showed us that you could use your phone to measure angle. What I did was I took that same pass fail screen and then I used the measure app. So you open the measure app, you select, um, you select angle <clears throat> and then you put it on your shin and you perform the same screen. And that'll actually give you the number of degrees that your ankle has. And the cool part about that is that it can show you progress. It can show that what you're doing is actually working. So you're not just wasting time on, on different correctives. Yeah. That's super and quick then, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can do it immediately. And then the coolest thing to me is that you can help the rower narrow in on the exact angle that's perfect for them in the boat. So if I have 45 degrees of ankle range of motion, that means I can set my, my ankle or sorry, my foot plate in the boat angled somewhere between plus or minus two degrees. So 43 or 47 degrees. And then that's kind of a, a sequence that you have to play with for a little while. But again, if you find the highest angle that you can row at where you don't have technical comp compensations, you're going to be more powerful and the force is going to be more vertical. And like you said, Anthony, it's going to allow you to get a little bit longer with each stroke. Yeah, so if, the, if you have 45 and you set that plate at something like 47, then it's going to make it a little bit harder, right? Most likely. Am I right? Um, Am I getting that right? Am I doing the math right? I don't, I don't think that you would notice that it gets harder. Oh, okay. But, but not harder, but it, but it would be harder. You wouldn't have the same mobility, though. Um, yeah, so... So if you, if you take it up high, you're going to need more mobility at the ankle. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the, the cool part about it is that it just makes you apply more force against that foot plate. So every stroke is more effective. Yeah. I was going to say, there's got to be a give and take there somewhere. And like you said, you just have to play with it. Yeah. You have to play with it and you probably have to use a coach for this. Um, because you don't, you don't always know what's right and what's wrong unless someone's watching you. Oh, yeah, just from the perspective of looking at uh, your technique, you mean? Yeah, exactly. So, like, a, a lot of coaches and a lot of the rowers have read, okay, well, the higher the angle, the better, and the higher my feet in the boat, the better, because it allows for more force potential. But, again, if if you're just doing it and you're compensating, you're just going to end up breaking down, and it's it's actually working against you. Absolutely. Um I don't, I know you talked about foot typing, but we're going to skip that today uh, just from the perspective of time. Uh, I will say in the book, you, he, uh, Blake does go over these screens. He shows you and he goes over the, the ankle number one, shows you how to do it. Uh, but Blake, once we find, I want to get into, uh, once we find these things, what are, you know, in terms of solutions, I loved your system in terms of mobilize, you know, once you identify, mobilize, confirm the change, utilize, maximize, and maintain. Could you go over that system? Yeah. So to be honest, I, tend, I can't take credit for it because it's basically, it's basically me trying to simplify all these other amazing systems like uh, Mike Boyle and um, FMS and uh, many others that I, I could list. But I basically just took those systems and I tried to simplify it um, for my audience. Um, and it's, it's also kind of the way that I think about it and the, the more simple, the better. Um, so mobilize is basically step one, right? If I have, if I have some sort of limitation that's mobility based, I'm going to spend time opening that up. So, so I can take those headphones, headphones off and I can hear again. Um, so just like everyone else, soft tissue work, stretching work, some correctives, that's what fits under mobilize. And then I move on to utilize. So I start to use that new range of motion. So again, once I open up range of motion, I don't want to stop there. I want to make sure that I'm actually using that new range so that my body can safely use it. And so it's more likely to stick around. Um, so I utilize by um, doing isometric holds first, and then I, and then I incorporate some movement. Um, and then after utilize, we maximize. So that's where we try to strengthen that new range. So again, we don't want to stop at just utilizing. We want to make sure that we we load it to the point that our body understands that it's safe to keep it around. So you'll start to load that movement. 
um, obviously safely. You're not going for PRs or anything. And then the maintain, I also call the bullet train. And I think this is the, the biggest, like somewhat recent thing that I've started using where I realized that I've, I've always used this whole sequence and you'll see changes, but they're not lasting or they're not happening fast enough. And when you see, when you see an athlete once a week, like most, most of my clients come to me once a week, if you see them once a week for an hour, you got a lot of changes to make in that hour. Um, and the biggest changes happen outside of their work with you. So the bullet train is basically, do you want to get there faster? Do you want the, do you want bigger changes? Um, and that's just the concept of let's, let's give you some homework that's easy to do at home that you can incorporate into your daily routine. And that's going to create a, a bigger lasting change. Love it. And have you, a lot of people talk about, I think the problem is they stop at, you know, the mobility drills, right? And then they don't really right after utilize that new range. And then they certainly don't kind of maximize that, that range. I know the guys at FRC talk a lot about those, those, that, that piece in the middle there maximizing at those those new ranges of motion uh you don't really see people go beyond that kind of you know mobility and and soft tissue work and that's why we don't see these changes that will last yeah and, and it's funny because all of these all of these systems have been talking about it and i've i've made the mistake as well where i've just you know spent too much time on soft tissue and stretching and kind of stopped there or slowed um and if you start to screen and use the FMS, et cetera, like you, you find out pretty quickly <laughs> that it's, that's it, that it's either not changing or it's not changing fast enough or sticking around. Well, the book is called the movement of rowing self-screening strategies for and solutions for the ankle. And, and Blake goes over everything also has um, a lot of videos that he uh, he's done as well to kind of accompany this. That's how this all started. So Highly recommended getting this. I'm excited to check my ankle mobility, check my rower's uh, uh, ankle mobility, and start to maybe hopefully use this system to make some changes in uh, for the upcoming season at Clemson. So, Blake, thanks so much for coming on and uh, and going over the movement of rowing. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I, I appreciate everything you've done, all the information you've shared, and specifically recently, uh, you amplifying Black voices during this time. I, I really appreciate and respect that. Thanks so much. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 289 of the Train Coach Podcast. Remember, you can still try out traincoach.com for 30 days, just a buck. We're only going till, until July 4th, so that's the end of this week. So make sure you do it. Get in there. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Paul, he's on every day. Remember, go to shrinkcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, free summer seminar series for everybody. Live presentations, Q&A sessions via Zoom, 67 top fitness pros, including me, that uh, you can take advantage of without ever leaving your home. It's the Perform Better Summer Series. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Blake Gorley for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Remember, Coach Boyle and I both use Train Heroic to deliver all of our online training. Head over to trainheroic.com and start your free 14-day trial. Thanks to Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Eric Degatti and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. My name's Anthony Rennie. My book, Be Like the Best, consists of 50 interviews with top fitness pros. And after each interview is a Be Like, which is just an action step or a challenge that will help you be like the best. I also have the Be Like the Best workbook, which is just a collection of those Be Likes. So check it out at continuefit.com. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again for listening. And I'll speak to you next time.